There we go. Awesome. Ladies, ladies, stay standing just for a second. At the end of the gathering, I'm going to ask y'all to come forward. I want to speak some things over you uh, collectively, but I just want to say how grateful we are for y'all. We uh, need you. You matter. You're important. What you do is oftentimes overlooked, unappreciated maybe, or recognized even, but uh, you are the deal. And uh, we're so thankful for you. Thank you for all that you do. It matters, and God's keeping score. We appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. We honor you today. I heard that there is a, what are y'all calling it, Steph? A Mother's Day Lounge. I would have really screwed that one up. A Mother's Day Lounge. And uh, so uh, here in Gulf Breeze and Navarre, yeah, y'all want to go in there? I, I popped in right before this gathering started, and they had a chair massage and had all kinds of stuff. They were given what's a bath... Bath bombs, there, just yeah, talk for me stuff. They uh, <laughs> bath bomb. It was really cool. Ladies were smiling. So, um, we appreciate y'all. And I want to bring a message today in the middle of this series. Now what? I kind of want to take a break from that and speak directly to mothers because I just think um, we don't want to overlook y'all. We want to talk to you today, and yet this message will apply to everyone. So if you're a guy, a woman, a mother, a father. Uh, it will apply to you. If you're a young person, it will apply to you. If you're a believer, it will apply to you. If you don't believe, it will apply to you. And uh, we're going to go to the Gospel of John. And I'm going to kind of set this up just a little bit. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were four Gospel writers. And oftentimes they would tell similar stories, the same stories, but they would tell it how they saw it. And uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels. What that means is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their story was similar. It, there, there was a similar pattern. Each one had unique things about them that Matthew might draw out that he's trying, he knows he's speaking to a Jewish audience. And so from Matthew chapter one, um, he's going to literally solidify the fact that Jesus uh, was the Messiah. And then he's going to say, look at his genes, look at his lineage. And so he's out to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Mark would use a word like immediately and straight away. And he was constantly using that word over and over to say, man, it happened. It happened. Luke was a doctor. Luke would give us some more details sometimes that doctors get and other people sometimes miss. So uh, Dr. Luke would give us a great eyewitness account. And then John, John, uh, John starts off totally different. Instead of right with the birth of Christ, he just tells us that Jesus is God. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, not a God, but God, all caps, right? Capital G, God. And where we're gonna go today in the book of John, you can go there, John six on your phones. If you have you version, go ahead and go there. Our notes are there. You can go to events, go to more. All the notes are right there. You can follow along. John chapter six, the longest chapter in the book of John. There's, uh, I believe 20, uh, one chapter is in John, John chapter six, the longest. And John is going to give us details that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not give us. And so what I love about the story I'm going to tell you today is so many things, but one of them is the fact that this is the only miracle. This is a, a creative miracle. And it's the only miracle that all four of the gospels give an account of. It's, it's, the, it's the only one. So not even, again, not even all four give the the birth of Christ, but they all give this one story. It's found in Matthew, it's found in Mark, it's found in Luke, it's found in John. And John is going to give us some details that the other ones didn't. Now, John is out to prove that Jesus is God, that Jesus is, is who he said he is. I mean, from the beginning, Jesus claimed to be God. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. You don't say that unless you're God or you're crazy. And so from the beginning, John is wanting us to know that Jesus is the Messiah. Are you with me? So if you're a new believer, the best thing you can do when you read the Bible is read the book of John. That'll help you. John is going to tell stories specifically to point to his purpose, which is to believe that, say it with me, Jesus is God. And a lot of religions, when it comes down to it, they believe Jesus was a good man. They believe Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was a good teacher. But they do not believe that Jesus is God. And 
If you read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it talks a lot about why that's so important. And so John's purpose is actually found at the back of the book, John chapter 20, verse 31. I want to read it to you. And John tells us why he wrote this book. It says this, but these are written so that you may continue. Someone say continue. Continue to believe. It's one thing to believe, but it's one thing to continue and to push through. Are you with me? Like it's one thing to start leg day, but it's another thing to continue and finish leg day. And so John's saying, I wrote these things so that you can continue to believe. 99 times in the book of John, in the gospel of John, that word believe appears. 99 times. He wants us to believe. So he's going to do a great job, master storytelling, to suck us into an incredible story. And at the end of the story, we're all doing this. Wow. He's God. In fact, John tells us the first miracle. First miracle ever happened, they're at a wedding and they run out of wine. And it gets to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then Mary gets to Jesus, says, we got a problem. They've run out of wine. And what does Jesus do? He takes water and he turns it into Welch's. No, he turns it into wine. He turns it into wine and they are like, oh my gosh, this is the best wine I ever had. They're like, why'd you save the best for the last? You know, this is crazy good. And the very first miracle Jesus does is he turns water into wine. It was a creative miracle. It's a creative miracle. I want you to think about that. Today we're going to read about the bread and fish and Jesus feeding the 5,000. But John's purpose is to prove the deity of Christ. And here's some references. If you want to write these down, these are really good. Because if a Jehovah Witness comes to your door, what they're going to attack is the deity of Christ. They're going to make you believe that Jesus was not God. And he is. And John helps us with that. So write these scriptures down. This is really important. This is truth that will anchor you. John 5, 8 and John 5, 18. John 8, 58. One of my favorite stories to take people to. John 8, 58. John chapter 9, 35 through 37. John chapter 10, 30 through verse 33. Verses 31, 32, 33. John 14, 9. John 17, 5. In John 20, verse 31. If you have you version, uh, it's all right there. If you don't, you can download it. It's free. And then our notes will be there. If you need help, we'd be more than happy to help you with that. So John says, these things are written that you may continue to believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life. John mentions life 55 times in his gospel. So that by believing in him, not by going to church, not by good works, not by this or that, not by giving money, not, no, but by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his, someone say name, the power of his name, Jesus' name. So John's point is to prove that Jesus is the son of God and the son of God means deity, that is father, son, Holy Spirit, that they're three distinct persons, but they're God. And so John is going to tell his story in such a way that we walk away saying, yep, we get it. Jesus is God. Because who else can, who else can take water and make it wine? You wish you could. <laughs> Only Jesus can do that. Who else can walk on the water? But Jesus. And if Jesus gives you an invitation and tells you you can't. Who else can take five loaves of bread and two fishes and feed 20,000 people? Jesus can. What's interesting about the first miracle ever recorded, and then this, which is the fourth miracle recorded in the book of John, is that they're both creative miracles. That is that he created, and this is the greatest creative miracle that Jesus ever did to demonstrate who he was. And what I love about that is in these two miracles alone, we have the wine and we have the bread. And those are the two essential elements of the Lord's Supper. John's trying to take us somewhere. Now, let's set up this story. The story happens around the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is beautiful. I'm going to show some pictures here in just a second, show a 10-second video and a couple of pictures. But the Sea of Galilee is, is in northern Israel, and then it has a river coming out of it, and that's the Jordan River, and it goes all the way down into the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. I'm just curious, how many of you have ever been to Israel? Have you been to Israel? All right, all right, okay. I said like two hands. How many have been to Walt Disney World? Raise your hand. 
Isn't that a great place? I love Walt Disney World. All right, here's my job as a pastor. I want to convince you, as awesome as Disney World and Disneyland are, I want to convince you that Israel is 10 times better. It really is. And we're going to go March 2020 to Israel. I want y'all to come with us. We're going to, it will fill up super quick. It will sell out fast. I want you to come experience the Bible where Jesus walked. It will come alive like you cannot even imagine, I promise you. But the Sea of Galilee is this beautiful place. There's mountains surrounded all the way around. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they let us know in the synoptic gospels that Jesus did, he did 80% of his ministry around Galilee. So you got little towns and villages all around fishing. I mean, that was the big thing, you know, and ships and, and uh, just a, a whole lot going on there. And Jesus is coming off of losing probably his best friend, definitely his cousin, John the Baptist. You probably heard of him, John the Baptizer. And, and can't go into all of it, but um, John offended someone preaching the truth. Uh, that person was a person of power and influence, had him put in prison. And then next thing he knows, John is, is uh, getting ready to be beheaded. Um, and Jesus now hears that his cousin, John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, I mean, Jesus shows up and he says, John, I want you to baptize me. We got beach baptism coming up Saturday. And uh, this is cool. That's going to be an amazing day. Last year was amazing. 176 baptized last May at one time. That was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Every person has a story. Every story matters to God. We celebrate the number and we celebrate the one. But John the Baptist got to see and hear something that, 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 we won't, and that is he baptized Jesus, and God the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So he heard God the Father as he's baptizing God the Son, and then he saw God, the Holy Spirit, descend like a dove from heaven, and he experienced the power of God, the power of the Trinity as he baptized Jesus. They were super tight. John was a forerunner. His job was to point to Jesus, and Jesus said, no one lived, no one lived, no man ever lived that was greater than John the Baptist. Are you with me? And now John the Baptist dies. He's beheaded for his faith. And Jesus has been given that news after having a very, no doubt, long season of loving people and ministering to people. I would imagine that it might be like if you're a athlete or a movie star, if you're someone very famous, someone that someone always wants to meet, always wants to get an autograph. I can't imagine being like a crazy movie star, an athlete, that you're a household name. Everyone knows who you are. Wherever you go, even if you're trying to just kind of incognito, you're there. They see you and they press in on you. Always want another autograph. Always want another picture. This is how it really was for Jesus. And so Jesus knows with his disciples coming back and giving an account of everything that had been going on and happening, they were tired and they needed rest. And God has such a heart. Jesus has such a heart that he wanted his disciples, his followers, his tribe, his family, if you please, he wanted them to get away and get some rest. Because the truth is the reason why we burn out is because we drain out. And who would know that better than moms? And I love the fact as I studied in all four accounts of this, the, this story, the feeding of the 5,000, I love this big setting. It, it was the setting of the table, if you please, for the miracle that happened. But often we just hear about the miracle and we miss the setting of it. The whole setting is, is Jesus just getting the worst news of his life. His cousin is beheaded. He's dead. And... Jesus, no doubt, is tired, and the disciples are come back, and they're tired after long, long, long uh, bouts of ministry and loving people and healing people and listening to people and loving people and all that, and they just need rest. And so Jesus is like, let's get away. And the people there heard that they were headed towards Bethsaida, and so the people literally began running on this big Sea of Galilee, also known as the, uh, uh, they call it the uh, Lake of Genesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and uh, same place. Um, but they hear the news that Jesus is going to the other side, and they begin running around the shoreline, and they literally beat Jesus before he can get there. I'm going to show you why. Let's look at this real quick, because this was probably a similar boat, something like this that Jesus got in. 
This was taken in October when we were in Israel with passion. And uh, we got to load a boat just like that. You see the mountain, mountainous view, so pretty. But um, not, not a big mower or, or, or uh, engine, not a, not, a, not a big engine on the back, you know. I mean, it, like, maybe like a little mower, you know, I mean, that, if even that. Or they're rowing. And so it's taking them a while to get there. And everyone else beats them to it. So they're standing, the boat's pulling up, and they're like, Jesus! And Jesus was trying to slip away quietly. You ever been there? Have you ever been there? Let me talk to the moms for a second. You been there, mom? You get up early. You have a list of things to do for the day. We have no idea until we grow up, do we? We have no idea how much mom does. I was watching my uh, cousin, his son hit his first home run. He's uh, like 12 years old, hit a home run over the fence. And my cousin was filming it and she's screaming, oh my God, and watching it run around and uh, trips running around. And, and then her little um, child, Hudson's right there. And while she's trying to be a good mom and capture this moment, dad's the coach, dad's over here, ah! you know, she's capturing the moment on the phone. She got little Hudson there and Hudson saying, mom, mom, I want some more candy. Mom, can I have some candy? Mom, give me some candy. Oblivious to everything else going on. And I just thought that so sums up what being a mom's all about, right? I mean, you saw the video we showed. I mean, mom's over here, then mom's here. She's superhuman. She's Wonder Woman. How does she do it all? And for, for real, how do you do it all? I, I, I don't know how you do it all. But I would imagine that there's some moms here today that you've often felt like that. In fact, you may be there today. You may be on the edge of burnout or drain out because you just constantly give out. And the best thing could happen is you need to come apart so you can rest before you fall apart. And so for us dads, maybe the best thing we could do is watch the kids Heard about one man got his wife a hotel room and said, hey, this is for you, not us. This is for you. Trust me, I'd rather it be for us, but this is for you. Here's some magazines, some movies. I've got the kids. I just want you to rest, sleep, refresh. And uh, I've got the kids, you know, and then wait like five minutes before we call and ask for help. <laughs> um, you know, I, I figured it out now being 43. I figured out why ladies put their makeup on in the car is because you don't have time to do it at the house. That's why. I get it now. I finally get it. I watched my wife and, you know, just Stephanie talking on the phone, you know, driving, putting on makeup and passing people all at the same time. I mean, you are like the queen, right, of multitasking. And you can just do so much. And the disciples felt like that. They felt like they'd just done a lot and it's, they need some me time, need to get away time. Let me show you a couple other pictures real fast here on the Sea of Galilee. So it's, it's a beautiful day. They're getting in a boat like this. They're going to the other side. They're probably high-fiving like, oh, we can't wait to eat. We haven't even eaten. How do you have breakfast? Right, moms? Like how many times do you get so caught up? You're feeding everyone else. You're doing for everyone else. You don't need to take care of yourself. You realize at dinner, that's why I'm hungry. I haven't eaten anything today. And so we're on this boat. Another picture, this Pastor Louis Giglio, uh, pastor of Passion City Church, and really the whole Passion Movement. And he was teaching about 40 of us on the boat. And it was cool, man, being on the lake right there um, on the Sea of Galilee. Don't call it a lake over there. They, they say it's not a lake, it's a sea. But, uh, and then this is Shelly, that's his wife. And Stephanie got to connect over there. Super cool um, people. But uh, it was just so peaceful, man. Just so felt God. Just had an amazing time worshiping. We sang some songs with a guitar on the water. It was just holy. And then uh, that was a picture. It was not a clear day, but it was a beautiful day. And uh, nonetheless, and then this one, just you can see, man, the mountains is gorgeous. And this last one is Steph, and you can see the beauty of the water right behind her. So as, as it began to clear up as we were coming back in. So this is where Jesus did 80% of his miracles, 80% of his Life and ministry were right there. And now Jesus gets to a place and all of a sudden there's more people. And the disciples are like, are you kidding me? For real? Like we can't go, no, can't you just hear it? It was like Steph, she's taking a shower yesterday and, and we're getting ready to go somewhere and there's a banging on the door, you know, bang, 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 bang. She just got into, you know, the shower, bang, 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 even louder, bang, 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 even louder. It's little Riley. 
you know? And so she's like, what? It's like emergency. I mean, like the emergency mode, something's wrong here. And, uh, and then Riley's like, mom, I just got a question for you, you know, but you would have thought about that knocking, man, something was wrong. It wasn't, it was just Riley didn't have Steph's attention. And uh, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so it's just crazy. It's crazy how much you moms do, um, even us dads. I mean, come on, guys, can we just admit it? I mean, I've gone to the pantry before the fridge and been like, babe, where is the milk? Of all things, you'd think I'd see the milk. Right in front of me, it's still in a white container, you know, and I can't find it. And this stuff's like, here it is, right here. You know, she looks at me like, did you not see that? Y'all just, y'all do so much. And sometimes I'm sure you get to the point where you're like, I just need a break. It's where the disciples were. And there are people there and Jesus sees them and he's moved with compassion and he begins to teach them. And now it's early afternoon to late afternoon to now it's early evening. And the disciples are thinking ahead. We have a problem. These people need to eat. There's a lot of people and they're going to need a place to sleep. So they come to Jesus and they tell Jesus, Jesus Tell the people to go away. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us this account. The disciples tell Jesus what to do. Jesus, tell them to leave. God bless them and send them. And uh, then Jesus asked, is there any bread? Let's jump into the scripture. We'll read some verses here. I want to pull out some different truths. Um, John chapter 6, we'll read a few verses here together. John 6, verse 1. After this, after what? When you read the Bible, if it says something like that, don't keep reading. Back up and find out what it's talking about. Because in the few verses before that, you would read about John the Baptist being beheaded. So chapters, our Bible was not divided into chapters until later, even after it was written. And so it's good. It helps us. And we have great Bibles that will help us. And even you version, thank God for you version, but it'll help us and give us a title of the next story. But sometimes you can miss what just happened if you just start right there. So after this, go back and read. But after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee or Lake Genesaret. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Why did they follow him? Because they saw the signs. They saw him heal people. I want to say today that Jesus still heals people, that Jesus is the healer. Jesus is my healer. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha, my God, my healer. Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday, and tomorrow he'll be the same as he is today. There's nothing that God cannot do today that God did in the past. He, he doesn't change. He's immutable. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why some people get healed on this earth and some people get healed forever in heaven. I've prayed over people and watched them been healed of cancer. And I've prayed over people and then did their funeral. But Jesus nonetheless is a healer. And even though you may have prayed for someone and Jesus did answer your prayer, maybe not the way we wanted it to, but Jesus did heal them better than they could have ever been on earth. It should not keep us from still believing and praying and asking Jesus to heal people on this earth. So they're following him. They see these signs as he's healing the sick. By the way, Jesus said, greater things you'll do. Verse three, then Jesus climbed a hill. If you're going to hang with Jesus, you're going to be moving and you're going to be climbing because there's a mission Then Jesus climbed the hill. He sat down with his disciples all around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. John wanted us to know that detail. Very important. And it's Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people and they're coming to look for him. They're coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? In one of the gospel accounts, um, I want to say it was Mark. Mark let us know that, that Jesus said, how much bread do we have? How much bread? In Israel, they'll eat bread. They'll, they'll have like this, uh, you know, you think like garlic bread before it's cut up, right? This awesome loaf of bread. And uh, literally, they'll take that and they'll take that and like a little thing of yogurt 
and, and that's not all they eat, but that's one of their favorite things that they eat. And they'll take this big bread and they'll dip it into the yogurt and they'll eat it. They love it. So bread is a staple. You got to have bread to have life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but he didn't say, don't eat bread. That's my diet. I'm sticking to it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> garlic, come on, Jesus. Butter, come on, Jesus. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Put the garlic and butter together. Mm, okay, focus them. Coming back to it. So turning to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip for he already knew what he's going to do. And let me tell you something. He will test you and he will test me and he already knows what he's going to do. Jesus does not live in the moment that we live in alone. He lives in this moment, but he lives in the next moment and the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. So sometimes Jesus tests us not to destroy us, but he tests us to see if we have faith. And as John said, I'm writing this so you may continue to believe because life will knock the belief out of you. The devil tried to, if he, if he didn't take anything from you, it's you believing that God is who he says he is, that God will do what he says he will do. That's called faith. So the enemy is always going to try to come and still kill and destroy our faith. He don't want us to believe. And Jesus will test. He did in the Old Testament. He does in the New Testament. He does today. He will test you even though he knows what he's going to do. Well, why does he do that? I think he does it for all kinds of reasons. Some will never know till heaven. But I, I just believe he likes to give us an opportunity to demonstrate our faith. And Philip, who is in the story here, um, I love this. You know, Jesus turns to Philip and verse 7, Philip replied, even if we work for months, Jesus, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Like, come on, Jesus. Like, you know, we, we, we don't have enough. We're not going to have enough. In other words, Philip told the creator. He told the creator of the universe that it was impossible. That's what Philip did. His mind focused on the lack of resources and the lack of money instead of focusing on the miracle maker. What's interesting is here is Philip who already watched Jesus turn the water into wine when they did not have enough. In fact, they had run out completely of wine. Jesus didn't take a little wine and stretch it. Jesus had no wine, so he took H2O and made it some of the best tasting H2O turned to wine ever known to man. They'd already watched that creative miracle. They'd already watched Jesus turn the water into wine. And Philip is here and he's sitting with the bread of life. That's Jesus. In John chapter 6, a couple of verses later, Jesus will do a whole teaching, a whole discourse saying, I am the beginning of seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. The house of bread. So here are the disciples, and they found just a little fish, little bread, and, and they're with the bread of life, the creator of the universe, and they think their problem is too big for Jesus. You ever been there? Mamas, you ever been there? The need is too great. The resources are so limited. But we begin to do what the disciples did. We begin to doubt. We begin to struggle. And... Yet we're reminded here that Jesus can meet our every need. Maybe you're a single mom here today. And you're like, I am tired, Tim. I'm exhausted. Jesus can meet your every need. Even when we're out of resources, Jesus can meet your every need. So Jesus says, hey, can we get bread? Do we have any bread? What do we have? How much bread do we have? Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, John 6, verse 8, he spoke up and he said, there's a young boy that's significant. We'll come back to that. When you read the Bible, you, if you're not careful, sometimes you read two or three words that mean so much and we miss it. We're going to come back to that, a young boy. There's a young boy. And by the way, only the gospel of John records the boy. Matthew doesn't, Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't. They don't say anything about the boy. They just say something about the loaves, the five loaves and the two fish. But John gives us this detail. And so Andrew seems like he's doing good. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. It's almost like he's beginning to believe that Jesus can do something with his fish and chips. 
that Jesus can, can do another miracle. But then we read on and Andrew says, but what good is that with such huge crowd? Man, little is much when God is in it. Jesus can still stretch our resources and meet our needs. But it makes me think, what do you have? Sometimes we think about what we don't have, but what do you have? Focus on what you have. What's in your hands? What do you have? Maybe there's some moms here today and you're like, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't have that, but what do you have? What do you hold? What do you have? And so they're looking at the negative and saying, we, this is so small because the need is great and the resources are limited. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Can I tell you something today? Don't underestimate what you do have. Don't overlook it. Don't underestimate what you do have because the truth is God can take what you have and God can use it. Maybe you think God can't use me. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert and man, I just, you know, I struggle being around people, you know, and I just, I get my strength from being away from people and, and I just, ah, you know, I'm struggling and God, God can use the little bit you have. All God needs is effort. God just, needs, God just needs you to show up. And here's the good news. The less of us, that means the more of him. Just faith, grain of a mustard seed. Just something small. God just needs a little bit. God can take your little time, resources. God take a little bit. And God can do amazing, amazing things with it. Verse 10 Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks to God. He, he prayed. Now, I don't think we need to be legalistic about this. I really don't. But I would encourage you to pray before you eat, in the middle of eating, at the end of eating. I think Jesus set a great example here when he prayed and he didn't do it because he had to do it. He didn't do it because this is just, just the Christian thing we pray. Have you ever done that? He prayed for the food, you know? And, uh, and you know, you pray the same prayer. Oh, Jesus, thank you for the food. Bless to our bodies. We love you. Amen. Type of thing or whatever. And sometimes it can just become a routine thing. I don't think it was that way with Jesus. I think Jesus was authentically having an attitude of gratitude because being God... He knew what God's power was about to do. He also went to the Father for his needs. And he led, not out of, I need you to do this, God, but he led out of an attitude of gratitude. Thank you for what we have. And he blessed it. Maybe we just need to realize that what we have is already blessed. Maybe we just need to realize that when we pray for our food, we don't pray to bless the food so it blesses our body. God's already blessed the food and he's blessed us to have the food. Maybe, maybe it's just having that attitude of gratitude like, God, you have been good to me. And when we're thankful for the little, with that attitude of gratitude, you know what God will do? God will give you a whole lot more. Some people, maybe today, maybe today's a shift for you, shifting of what I don't have to what I do have. And Jesus gives thanks for what seems to be such an insignificant amount of food for so many people. So he gave thanks to God. He distributed them. These are the pieces of bread and fish. He distributed them to the people. And the same with the fish. And they ate. They all ate. John's only one said they all ate as much as they wanted. Here it is, verse 12. And everyone was full. Everybody, everyone is like, whoo, I can't eat another piece. Everyone was full. So the need was great and the resources were limited, but the supply was abundant because not only were they full, but Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and they filled the 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Today, I'll name the, this message Mama's Hands. As I got thinking about this, this is about eight months ago, I was studying for a different message, and the Lord, in like less than 30 seconds, dropped this message into my heart. And I was like, oh, that's so good. And I began to write it, and then I had to wait eight months to preach it. And it was okay, because we're here today. But God showed me something I never saw before. 
So I studied each account of the gospels, want to get the big picture. But in studying this, all of a sudden, and God actually giving me this thought, it was like, who made the boys lunch? Who made the boy? This was a little boy. If there was, even was a dad in the picture, because there might not have been. But if there was a dad in the picture, dad was probably out fishing. You know who made this boy's lunch? Mama made the lunch. Mama made the lunch. Mama made the lunch. Mama made the lunch. It was just something ordinary. It was something that mom did all the time. She made the lunch all the time. She loved her boy. She, she gave five pieces of bread, barley loaves, and two fishes. So uh, what it makes me think is that this is a generous mom. She wanted him and his buddies to, to have some. Hey, you, hey, son, you make sure you, there's two fish for you. Like You share a little bit, but it's fish for you. You need the protein. You're little. You got to grow. And there's extra bread. You can give the bread to your friends. You know, there's plenty for all of y'all, but you got some fish here. She, she did extra. And, and the difference between, between ordinary and extraordinary is just a little bit of effort. Sometimes it's just turning at 1%. It's just that little thing. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about Mother's Day because that's, that's who you are, ladies. It's what you do. You give that extra effort. And here's this mom who thinks she's doing just an ordinary task, right? And, and we know. I mean, I watch Stephanie. She goes and goes and goes. And I try to help. I can't keep up with her. She's a wonder woman. I don't know how she does it all. It's crazy. I mean, y'all pick up all the clothes off the floor. And then there's more clothes on the floor. And you hadn't even got the first load done. I'm talking about washing, not even folding, putting away. There's more clothes. And you get the more clothes. And then there's more laundry. And there's, there's more dishes. And there's more. I got to sweep again. Thank God for the Roombas, right? Come on. Like, there's more. And there's more. And there's more. And then there's this. And then there's projects. I mean, we got to do homework. And some of y'all moms, y'all do amazing projects. <laughs> I seem like this kid, three years old, man, with this project. I know that three-year-old didn't do that. I know that was mama. I mean, this kid got a 3D volcano, hit the button, electricity. And like, yo, mama's pretty awesome. This, so what don't you do? What don't you do is take a break, get a breather, take a breath, come apart, have some me time, some girl time. Need to do more of that. This mom was doing something that was just so ordinary. It was just her normal routine to make this lunch. And here it is, y'all. She thought that it was just ordinary. But your ordinary sets the table for extraordinary. You hear me today? Your ordinary sets the table for extraordinary. So what I want to tell you today is keep making the lunch, mama so Jesus can use it. Keep making the lunch. Keep getting up and keep realizing that God shows up in what you call ordinary. God calls extraordinary. What you think is just nothing. It's just what, it's just, you do it with love. It's not like you don't care. You do it with love, but you think it's insignificant. God says it is very extraordinary. Keep making that lunch. Keep making that lunch. Keep making that lunch. Keep making that lunch. John's the only one who tells us about the little boy who brought a lunch. And we could talk about the faith that that, uh, that boy had. We talked about how the, the boy was willing to give up his lunch. But I want to focus on the mama. The mama, because you don't get the miracle without the mother. You don't get the miracle without the mother doing what she did that day. You don't get it. You don't get the miracle without the mom. I, my goodness, we can't even spell momentum without mom. <laughs> can't do it. Your ordinary sets the table for extraordinary. I want you to remind yourselves when the devil's lying to you and telling you you're not enough, you're not doing enough, you're not good enough. You feel like you're spinning all these plates and truth is you are getting like hundreds on most of them. And I know just living with an awesome mom that sometimes y'all beat yourself up because you got a 95 over here and you got a hundred, 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 104. How do you get that? Please tell me. Someone tell me that one. I, I want to do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're getting all these phenomenal, like that's amazing, amazing, amazing. You're getting the extra credit. You're doing everything right, but you don't 
give yourself any credit. And Jesus gives you a lot of credit because this story included the boy, which made us remember the mom. The same bread that Jesus took and broke and blessed and gave, distributed, was the same bread that mama's hands touched. The same fish that fed everyone. That fish that left everyone full. And then they collected 12 baskets remaining. I believe that was one basket for each disciple because they didn't believe. They forgot that when you're with the bread of life, five pieces of bread, two fish are more than enough because you're with the bread of life and Jesus can do anything. I believe Jesus was like, Philip, Andrew, where's Andrew at? Andrew, this one's yours. Mamas, keep making the lunches because your ordinary sets the table for extraordinary. I'd like all the mothers to come right now at this time. I'd like you to come forward. All the mothers, if you're here today and you have a desire to be a mother one day, I would like you to please come too. This is a holy time. I would love for you to come. I believe this is an act of faith and without faith, it's impossible for us to please him. I believe even if there are teenage girls in here, we don't want you to be a mother now, but we want to, and trust me, I'll get an amen from all these mamas up here. Trust me, you don't want to be a mama now. Um, there's a whole lot to it. But I believe even having teenage girls pray over them for one day. I pray with my daughter. You know, she's 11. God make her an awesome mom. And one day, and I believe God will, man. She's got an awesome um, example. And Stephanie, she's just the best mom anyone could ever ask. But all the ladies up here, I want to look in your eyes. I want to talk to you all for a minute. And I just want to tell you a couple things. Number one, I think there are some ladies here today. Today's a tough day. It's a rough day. And it's a rough day because you lost your mom. And for some of y'all, you lost your mom years ago maybe even decades ago. For some people today, it's been very recent. There are people in our church, very recently, you've lost your mom. And so every Mother's Day is hard. It's hard because it's a reminder of the absence that you feel, the pain that is there because mom isn't. And I just want to tell you that God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he sees that pain and he knows your name and he loves you so much. I believe there are women here today that uh, today uh, you have kids and, and you're there. You're draining out. You're burning out. It, you, you're giving out. You're giving so much. And I think what you need to hear today is that Jesus would say, come apart and rest. I want you to rest. You don't have to, you know, I mean, the house not always looking like it could be on the front cover of a magazine is, is, is okay instead of you losing your sanity. Are you with me? Right, right? I mean, because I've watched my kids. Step and pick up a pillow. I'll pick up a pillow. You fold a blanket. It's not two seconds. And it's like, walk away and count to five. Walk away and count to five, right? And, and some of y'all are so in it, and you have kids, and you're worn out. You're just tired. And I think Jesus would speak to you today, rest. Get some rest. Listen, we honor you as Wonder Woman, uh, Wonder Woman, women. But realize, realize that you're human. And you need sleep. And lots of it. And you need time for yourself. And if your husband's like, you know, needs to grow in the area of letting you pamper yourself a little more, trust me, men, it's worth it. Let them pamper themselves. She wants to be beautiful for you. Do it. Whatever. Well, it costs money. Uh-huh. And your point is, because when we golf, we like, them shoes only 300 bucks. They on sale today. My God, he even answered my prayer in Jesus' name. Right? We go hunting. We spend all kinds of money. But uh, y'all just, just do that. I just would say to you that I really believe God. I prayed for his heart today just in speaking over you that Jesus would just say, some of y'all just need to rest. You need to give yourself a break. You give yourself a break. And realize that uh, everything doesn't have to be perfect. God sees you beautiful. I think there's some ladies here today, truth is you want to have kids and you haven't been able to. There are women standing here today. There are women in, 
in Navarre today, women watching online today, and you've had one, you've had two, you've had three miscarriages, and your heart is just broken. And you have doubted God, you've doubted his love, you've been angry, and God can handle your doubt and your anger. That's the cool thing about God. He, uh, he can handle all that and more. And I just would say to you today, what Isaiah says in Isaiah 54, verse 1, he says, let the barren women sing. I was driving down the road this week, and whew, Jesus, help me. God gave me this thing to say to you today, and that is if you're here and you haven't had a baby, go buy an outfit. Go buy an outfit. When we started our church, we didn't have a drummer. You know what we did? We went and we bought a drum set. You know why? Because you give God some place to put the blessing. It's, it's, you got to demonstrate your faith. Well, I already did, Pastor Tim. Well, I get it. Do it again. John said that you may continue to believe. That you may continue to believe. Go buy an outfit. You believe in God for twins? Buy two. I prayed for twins since I was in high school. I don't know why. I was just like, I want twins, man. You know, and then I met Stephanie. She's like, I want five boys. I was like, oh, girl, you're beautiful and awesome. <laughs> And then we change our thinking a little bit. <laughs> we thank God that Jesus doesn't answer every prayer. He knew I couldn't handle twins. And he knew Steph would kill me. <laughs> oh, man, thank God God doesn't answer every prayer. You know what I'm saying? God knows all about the timing, too. He knows all about the timing. And so go buy an outfit. And I want you to put it in that room that's going to be your baby's room. And I want you to declare it by faith. Because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. And his hand is not short, it's not limited, that he cannot save. And if God can take a woman named Mary and give her a baby when Mary never slept with a man, my God, God can give you a baby sleeping with a man. Can we just go there? All right? You think, and, and, and thank God for doctors. We got doctors here, surgeons. Thank God for the medical profession. Nurses, I love them. But I'm telling you something, God has the final say. And if God wants you to have a baby, your name will be Sarah 99, and you'll find yourself pregnant when you laughed when someone said, God said you're going to have a baby, and you went, <laughs> and then you're like, <laughs> and you named that baby Isaac, which means laughter, because you laughed. The joke's on you. Because God can do anything. Are you with me? God loves you. There's nothing he can't do. And there's nothing he won't do. There's no wall. He won't knock down. No mountain he won't climb. Are you with me? God sees your heart. Like stay in faith. And I want you to get that outfit and put it on that doorknob. Put it in the room. Put it wherever you see it every day. And when you see that outfit, I want you to begin to sing. I want you to begin to sing. And that sing, your singing will become like an awesome fragrance in heaven and God will see you and God will answer your prayer. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. I know my God is going to do it. He said he would do it. Isaiah 54, 1. I'm going to stand on that promise of God's word. If he said he'd do it, he'll do it. I'm going to believe him for it. It may not be exactly like I thought, but he's going to do it. It may not be exactly when I wanted it to happen, but he's going to do it. So let God be true. Let God be true because God's got the final say. So buy that outfit and break into singing. Tell him how good he is. You're a good, good father. Don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. You got a promise. And I, I don't know how that feels. I've cried with women, prayed with families, prayed for women, even in this community. Awesome story. Watch God do a miracle in giving this family a baby, another baby when there was no way, medically speaking, they could have another baby. God can do that. And uh, I just want you to believe that. I want you to believe that. So I want to pray over y'all. I want you to put your arms around each other. Some of y'all are already doing it. Mama's just got such a heart, you know. Mama's got a heart for mamas. That's the cool thing about mamas. they like, all the mamas, all the mamas. My baby mamas, come on. And we get everyone together. We're going to pray over y'all for wisdom, courage, and strength. Wisdom to know what to do. The strength and the courage to do it, even when it's hard. Strength to keep going. Strength to keep believing strength to keep pursuing that child heart. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you and your mother are not close and you never were. God can change that story too. Let's pray. Jesus, I love you and we love you and we thank you that there's nothing that you can't do, nothing that you won't do when it comes to your will. 
God, Lord, you said, I love that scripture, Isaiah Penn, where, where uh, he said, let the barren woman sing. Let her sing. I pray that women here today, God, who have been through it, I pray they would begin to sing to you. And I pray that they would see the joy, have the joy, know the joy of raising children. Because you said that if a barren woman would sing, you would give them more, women, more babies than the women that already have kids. You're just saying, Lord, that even though the need is great and the resources are small, Lord, that the supply is great. Your power is great. For the women here today struggling because they lost their mom, comfort them. For the women here today who don't have a good relationship with their mom, heal their relationship with their mom. For the women here today, Lord, that they're raising kids. For the single mama here today, Lord, who's burning the candle at both ends. Give them extra strength, I pray. And help these women, Lord, to realize that their ordinary sets the table for extraordinary. Help them to realize that the power is in their hands. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. God bless each of you. God bless y'all. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for not qu Oh, yes. Yes, Lord. Yeah, one more. Yes, Lord. And I felt this last gathering. I'm going to say it this gathering. If you're a mama and you're here and you're so overwhelmed, that you're just like, oh, I just want to walk out. Let us pray with you. I don't know. I don't know, but I just believe God put that in my heart. There's someone here and, and you, you're just so at the place where there seems to be nothing next. Instead of walking out, whatever that looks like, call out. Don't walk out. There are people around you that love you, that don't even know you, that do anything to help you. So speak up for yourself. You teach your kids to. Do it for yourself. Don't you quit. Don't you walk out. You call out. You cry out. And you watch Jesus do what only Jesus can do. Thank you. That's what God wanted me to say. We love y'all. Happy Mother's Day. Don't go back to your seats. Hope it's an amazing day. Getting ready to uh, end this gathering. I want to give people an opportunity to make Jesus your Savior. And if you're here and you've never settled in your heart, you've never settled, never gotten peace, never accepted Christ, today's your day. Today's your day. God, God made us all in His image, male and female. He created them. He made us in His image. God, part of God's characteristic is the heart of a mother, that nurture. God loved us so much that even though like kids, we wandered into sin, God has that nurturing heart. So he sent us his son, Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. He became our sins and he gave us his life for our life, his perfection for our sin. He traded places with us so that we who are sinners could be made right with God. And religion can never make you right with God. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away your sins and make you right with God. So Jesus went to the cross, shed his blood, three days later, walked out of that grave to prove to everyone that he was who he said he was. He could do and did do what he said he would do. He's God. And that's why you and I ought to follow him the rest of our days. And if you're here today and you know what it is to lay your head on the pillow and struggle with fear of death, to go to a funeral like I'll be at tomorrow of a young man to realize that death comes to all of us and what you do while you're living with Jesus determines where you spend eternity forever and it doesn't have to go bad for you even if you say I don't deserve it none of us deserve it that's why it's called grace we just accept the gift and we realize that God loved us so much he wanted to adopt us into his family that's the heart of God. It's really the heart of a mother to nurture. So while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 
And if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So with eyes closed and heads bowed, I want to lead you in a sinner's prayer. You're not going to pray to me. You're not going through me to get to God. You're going to go right to God. I'm going to pray it. I'm going to ask you to repeat it. We'll pray it out loud. Even if you're a believer, we do that for people who will pray it for the first time. After the prayer, I'm going to ask everyone watching online in Navarre and Blackwater here in Gulf Breeze, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand high, not to be afraid or ashamed, but to hold it up high. We want to celebrate what God did in your life today. So let's pray. Would you pray with me? Would you say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I feel your love and I accept your love. Thank you for dying for me, for shedding your blood. I believe you rose again. I believe you're alive today. I now give you my life and I receive your life. Now teach me how to live in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Whether you, if you did that today, whether you're watching online or at one of our campuses, we want you to let us know. Please do that. It's as simple as letting us know online. You can just say, Jesus made me new. Let us know that. Send us that message. If you're watching wherever, if people watch from all over the world, let us know. If you're here in Navarre, Blackwater, or Gulf Breeze, we're going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't hesitate. Wait. Don't procrastinate. Hold it up. Hold it up on the count of three. We're going to clap for you. We're going to give you a gift that will help disciple you. And we're going to celebrate you on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Right now. Hold it up high. That's right. That's right. Hold it up. Hold it up high. I did that today, Pastor Tim. Hold it up, Navarre. Let's go, Blackwater. Hold it up. That's right. Hold it up high. 